Uh, so any questions before we get started? Is, uh, I'm trying to set this mic so we don't get the uh, echo. Can everyone hear me okay? Sounds good. Yep. Good. But, but we actually want echo on you. Well, we want echo, but <laughs> we don't want to give it away. So we start the session by singing Always Look on the Bright Side of Life by Monty Python and carry on from there, yeah? Well, we are live, and, and I don't think we can afford those royalties. <laughs> True. Uh, <laughs> Good point. <laughs> um, I'm Larry. But we truly are live, so hello, everybody. Thanks for coming to yet another Quarantide. This is the first AES edition of Quarantide, so I'd like to begin by thanking our hosts from Eventide. It's really generous of you to dedicate the resources to this. It's not just what you see here. They have some back office support, IT support to make this work. So, so thank you, Richard and Tony. It's really kind of you. Quite welcome. We'll, of course, start off with introductions. Um, and what I'd like to do is also when you in ask you to introduce yourself and also tell us what you're listening to right now. What's the soundtrack for your pandemic? Um, so I'm going to start with my boss, the president of the AES, Agnieszka Roginska. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Agnieszka Roginska, and uh, I am the president, the current president of the Audio Engineering Society um, this year. And uh, that's a really good question, Alex. I've been, uh, so I have two kids and I've been uh, connecting a lot more with my kids over the past several weeks and been listening to a lot of their music. So we're listening a lot to um, Tate McRae and the Lumineers. My son, who's nine, is a huge Queen fan. And so we've been listening to a lot of Queen, a lot of it remastered by our AES member, Bob Ludwig. Um, and of course, I've been branching out to Fortnite con virtual concerts. Um, but I personally have been li uh, listening to Bowie's uh, Changes Now album that just came out um, a, a little while ago. So it's been a fun couple of months. Indeed. Uh, well, let's move on to the president-elect, Jonathan Weiner. What's up? Speaking of David Bowie, <laughs> I've had so much time listening to those songs. Um, hi there. Um, I'm Jonathan Weiner. I'm... Uh, going to be the president of AES next year and learning everything I can from Agnieszka and everybody else here. Um, uh, also a reformed French horn player and uh, I'm the um, education director at Isotope and also a, a practicing mastering engineer. Uh, as far as what I've been listening to, I, I have two answers. One is the, uh, the, the tongue in cheek. There, there are a bunch of people who put together some really delightful playlists for the times that include songs such as Don't Stand So Close to Me by The Police. Uh, there's also Clean Hands by Alanis Morissette. And then, of course, that famous Three Dog Night song, One is the Loneliest Number, which I think everybody can kind of relate to these days. Um, but in all seriousness, um, I've gone back and rediscovered a bunch of works by somebody who I think is one of the, the least appreciated composers, uh, a neoclassicist named uh, Ralph Vaughan Williams and um, mining his compositions and enjoying it immensely. It really takes me to a different place. So it sounds like you haven't recovered from being a horn player. You're, you're <laughs> no, I'm, I'm still suffering. It's definitely PTSD here. Excellent. Well, we also have staff members from the Audio Engineering Society here. So I'd like to introduce you to Colleen Harper. Hi everyone, I'm Colleen Harper. I'm the executive director of AES. Um, I also have two young kids. Uh, so we've been doing some old school Disney and some dinosaur songs because we're in a big dinosaur phase. Uh, I also have, on, have been on quite a Joni Mitchell kick since she received the Les Paul Innovation Award at the Tech Awards. Um, and also Sam Smith. I've been listening to a lot of Sam Smith um, in, my, in my quarantine here. That's really great. Uh, and then there's the only person I know in Nashville who says crikey. On the Hi. <laughs> Thank you, sir. My name is Graham Kirk. I am the sales and marketing director for the AS. Um, I've had Van Halen on very loud recently, but before I started losing it, um, listening to a bit of Stevie Wonder and um, Gloria Gaynor on repeat, I will survive. Quite poetic. That's great. Tony, how about you? So my name is Tony Aniello. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Eventide's, I guess, fossil in residence, although I haven't been there for the last uh, month or so. 
Um, I've been listening to quite a bit of John Prine, who I didn't really know very well. Um, last night I put on some vinyl of uh, Paul McCartney's first al album. I was listening to Junk, which is an amazing song. Um, other than that, I've been listening to some, some David Bowie. Um, and that's pretty much it. Very nice. Richard Factor, who are you and what are you listening to? Well, you'd have to start with the difficult question, wouldn't you? Who am I? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Richard Factor, uh, one of the founders of Eventide. And uh, I'm on vacation, basically. Uh, I live in Sedona. And Sedona hasn't changed all that much. Uh, we, can, uh, we can still walk on the trails. Uh, the restaurants are just starting to reopen. I've been trying to support people, uh, local, uh, local people with takeout or what have you uh, in the past weeks. And I am a victim of 60s and 70s psychedelic sensibility. Wow, that's quite a bit of sibilance. Um, I listened to, uh, to this internet radio station, uh, psychedelicized, and uh, I rediscovered David Bowie from that, actually. Uh, I didn't really know his material that well, but uh, I uh, learned a bit about it. And before I, uh, I finish that, I have two questions. One for Colleen, who is, which, is, which is your favorite Joni Mitchell album? Oh gosh, um, I just listened <laughs> to a playlist. It would be hard to say. I don't know. I just jumble all of her music together and listen to. I, I, give me some time. Come back to me. Okay, we'll we'll come back. And uh, Jonathan, when when you say you're a refor reformed French horn player, does that mean when uh, when the ship gets in sight of uh, the United well America at the time, you can't go do 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 do. What was that? <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan Freeberg fans here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that might be about all I can muster at this point. But, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I spent a lot, of, a lot of time playing, playing the French horn in my formative years. Okay. Our, our condolences. <laughs> um, uh, there, there is one other uh, song that I, I listened to. I don't know how I could have forgotten because it's 16 minutes long. Uh, Dylan released a song called Murder Most Foul. Which is quite amazing. Yeah, and it's a new release, right? Just for these release. times. Yeah, and he released it right when we all went into quarantine. And I, I think he uh, dropped a, a, an album on September 11th, actually. I think Love and, and Theft. Pretty sure. Yeah, I'll throw in one more thing that I've, I've been really enjoying. So um, I, I, I happen to teach music production as well. And one of the exercises that the students engage in is they um, they collect a bunch of recordings by um, well-known or seminal uh, recording engineers and producers and then present them all at once. We build playlists. And um, I actually have just been sitting and kind of agog ag at the work of Serb and Ganea, just going through the catalog as a mix engineer. His, his ability to realize an arrangement is absolutely astonishing and mind-blowing and that's something I've really been enjoying his work and Manny Marikin and actually um, Trina Shoemaker also was one of the subjects and her work is just remarkable um, so it's been kind of nice to have a little extra time to just sit back and mine the work of, of some of these shining lights in music production do you think as a side effect of, of this quarantine do you think you're listening to music more now and in larger doses or is life still too hectic to to have that attention span we might have had decades ago? Well, I mean, I'm not sure how other people feel, but I, I certainly have more time to do more different things. And I'm spending my time differently. And, and in some cases, it does create an opportunity to, um, to listen to music where I may not have had that otherwise. Um, and music is certainly a wonderful way to, to get away from the news. Um, but um, I actually, I, I have a treadmill and I was running and I, I would put on a playlist of Adam Ayan's favorite masters that he had made from Gateway. Mm -hmm. And so I was actually listening to music while I was multitasking, I guess, <laughs> while I was running. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there is, um, there, there are a lot of things that are different right now. And uh, it does afford the opportunity to, 
to put something on, not just as a, a background, um, but some, a different accompaniment, I guess. Do you prefer to run with drummer's perspective or audience perspective? <laughs> For me personally, I've had a lot no. more time to, to, to listen to music and to, um, to actively listen to music, because usually I listen to music when I'm going somewhere or in the car. But now, uh, you know, in the evenings, we sit down and we listen to music actively or something I haven't done in a long time. I'm, normally I would be in, in New York City in, in Manhattan, but I've uh, escaped to the, to the woods of Woodstock and uh, I've made it a point during quarantine to do a hike a day. Every day I go hiking religiously un unless there's hail coming down, which, which there has been. And I've been listening to music in nature and it's just been such a wonderful experience to be connected to music, but also to be connected to music in, in nature. It's been wonderful. And the, and the sky is really blue. Today, yeah. Lately. Yeah, this, yeah it's been clearing up for sure. I could chime in quickly. Um, you know, working from home affords different opportunities than being in an office. In an office, there's people stopping in to talk. There's a lot of commotion. There's a lot of things happening. So when I was commuting to an office, I would listen to music on my commute. And it was about 15 minutes that I would have on the subway. And now that I'm at home and I don't have my commute, I actually find myself listening to a lot more music because I'm kind of shut away in the office that I have set up here and I'm not seeing my coworkers. I'm not having that daily commotion. And so for me, it actually helps a lot to have that music. And sometimes it's, it's almost white noise-like where I don't really, I'm not really paying attention to it. And at other times, if it's a very powerful song or if it's something that, you know, really uh, that resonates a lot with me in that moment, um, it can make me feel like I have a lot more energy. It can make me very thoughtful. It, can, it depends on my mood, but I've been listening to a lot more music being at home than I, than I do normally. And it's been a nice change. I've really enjoyed it. You know, something else I, th I thought it's sort of a slight change of subject or a tangent here, but um, because we're listening so much in these sort of online meetings and these modalities, I've become more, even more highly sensitized to sound and sound quality and sound environments and where people are speaking. And it's actually been, a, there's been a teaching opportunity to it with my students and talking about, you know, how well they can be heard as they're sort of participating in classes and so on. But um, boy, I'm, I've just become hypersensitized to the, the sort of concept of sound quality. And I say even more so because as a mastering engineer, I'm always thinking about, you know, signal path and fidelity and so on. But, but now this is even in conversation. I mean, it's, it's, it's just sort of showing up as a, a much more persistent theme in, in my, uh, my day to day. And, um, so I really think that Zoom's gonna, gotta up their game. I think you get no argument from anyone here. Well, in order to up one's game, one probably joins the Audio Engineering Society. I'm uh, looking around at the tiled images here, and it is absolutely true to say that I met every single one of you because of AES. That's my connection to all of you. Um, so in no particular order, I'm wondering if you can speak to when you joined, why you joined, and what do you get out of AES? What is what has it done for you? I, I'm going to volunteer to go first because I'm probably the uh, longest uh, longest term member here. Uh, I think I joined in maybe '65, uh, maybe uh, maybe a little bit later. Uh, Even Tide was founded in '70, wow. and uh, surely I was a member at that point. We went to conventions. But uh, I date it all back to, uh, to meeting Bob Moog in Trumansburg, New York, before he was Bob Moog. Uh, I had this, uh, this storefront, and uh, I, I saw behind a curtain, pulled the curtain aside, and there was the, uh, the Moog synthesizer, which was his, uh, his special project before the, uh, or after the theremin. And uh, that was, uh, I didn't know it at the time, of course, but that was uh, kind of seminal in my, uh, my alleged life. And he wrote an article, I think it was uh, July, maybe July 65 issue of, uh, of the AES Journal, which I had never seen or heard of at the time. I was, uh, you know, just a, just a kid. And 
the concept of the uh, the voltage controlled oscillators and uh, and amplifiers using uh, characteristics of the uh, semiconduct semiconductor junction uh, was all new to me at the time, and I got the AES journal. I guess because uh, Bob referred it to me, or I was looking it up, or whatever, and I was really interested in building those modules, which I uh, which I did with discrete components uh, on little IBM computer circuit boards that I had to file all the parts off and heat them over the stove. And anyway, my uh, my interest and uh, membership, I think, dates that far back. And uh, I am now, thank you, AES, a uh, a life member. Well, I, sh I should go next because you're the reason that I joined the AES. So I'm a little bit younger than Richard and I met Richard in, at the very end of 1972, I was in grad school. Uh, Richard gave me a project to, to work on, uh, just gave me a project in a book, a TTL data book, asked me if I could solder. I said, well, a bit. And I was, I was studying physics and acoustics in, in, in grad school, but I, I did know how to solder without getting burned. And so, uh, so I, I did this project and a few months went by. I graduated in May. And around the fall, Richard said, there's a convention and you, you've got to come at the Waldorf. You got to help out. I'm not sure if I was an employee at that point, Richard, but that was the first AES I attended. Um, and I joined pretty much immediately. Um, Tony, so one way to that, know. That, that, uh, so I was roped in by Richard. One way to know if you're employed is if he pays you. Has he ever paid you? Uh, Are you a volunteer I, I, for I even paid, But I don't really feel, Richard, as if you're paying me. <laughs> <laughs> So well, oh, Richard I, did, did once lend me a $5 bill. And did you pay it back? In a way. Not in a sense. <laughs> in a sense. I, uh, one day, this is also early on, uh, he bought the first shredder I had ever seen, and he was very proudly showing it off. So I asked him for $5, and I put it in the shredder. And you were out. You were and he's never early. stopped. <laughs> So I'll, uh, I'll join here. I, I joined AES, I think it was in 1984, 1985. And at the time, I was actually teaching in a small school, uh, teaching audio engineering, a small school in uh, South Central Ohio called the Recording Workshop. And at that time, you know, AES was this kind of mythic, you know, organization that represented all things audio. Uh, that, and I was just kind of a, a young, aspiring engineer. And I thought, well... Clearly, there. This is where all of the quote important people are. Uh, one of the organizations. I think it was some friends of mine that I was teaching with who made me aware of it. And I thought, well, you know, if there are important people doing interesting and important things, let me join AES and see what comes of it. And I started getting a journal. Uh, I started getting a book with articles, and I started to read and and hear the uh, 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 correspondence from AES about some of the goings on and, you know, th there was just a natural inclination on my part to kind of join the club. It was like, well, this is something I'm passionate about and these are my people. Um, and that, that for me was the genesis of it. It was really in some ways uh, the hope um, that it was going to ultimately um, benefit me by sort of elevating my own practice and learning things. Lo and behold, you know, as the years went on and I started to attend, I had the opportunity to attend AES conventions. Uh, I moved back to uh, the Boston area. I grew up in New York City and going to New York for a convention was not so difficult. And, um, and immediately by being proximate to all of the other members and people who attended, my network just exploded, blew up. Um, and not only in ways that I expected. Of course, I was running into other people who were in similar places and stations in their careers, kind of up and coming, at the beginning, just learning. But I also would run into people who um, ultimately became mentors, people who were heroes of mine, um, who, much to my astonishment, were incredibly generous with their time 
and their knowledge. People like Tom Bates, um, and uh, who unfortunately passed away a few years back, but he was somebody who I just benefited from a, such a long and rich association with, learned a great deal about many things from. Um, and I, I think I credit AES with developing a lot of relationships, um, developing relationships with mentors, with people who became peers. And at this point, you know, I'm, I'm really very um, proud of the fact that it is a place where I can also encourage other people who were where I was once and sort of have that, this feeling of giving back and mentoring other people and creating opportunities for other people. Um, you know, I found my voice a little bit at AES when I started to present. Um, I remember submitting some ideas to a, a convention in New York City in the early 1990s. Um, and this was around surround sound and DVD audio and, and such things. And much to my surprise, uh, my proposal was accepted. And so I got to actually get up on a dais and, and try to sound intelligent. And actually, I sat, sat right next to and went right after Bob Ludwig, which was terrifying. Um, I survived that. Um, and, um, but, you know, as I look back, as I reverse engineer things, the benefits that have accrued have been incredible. I mean, whether it's, you know, being able to go to a convention and see a piece of gear in person that I otherwise didn't have any access to or talk to somebody who I might never have access to and develop my network and, um, and learn. And I've also made lifelong friends from around the world as a result of being an AES. I have friends now and really on every continent uh, that I would never, ever have met. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a really, really exciting experience to have it be a persistent thread in my audio life and in my life in general to have been a member of AES. And, and um, when I started out, I don't think I could have imagined all that might happen. You know, I, I want to second that. And I, I also want to point out, you know, something in, in my experience, that the relationships you form are, are really wonderful. It's really a community of sharing because all of us are doing this because we love music, we love audio. Almost all of us play some instrument. Um, you know, it's not like going to a, a, a banker's convention or a pharmaceutical. I mean, there's competition. People do feel competitive, I guess, in a sense. But the degree of sharing I've experienced over my career has just been wonderful. I mean, I really couldn't have accomplished any of this w without having the interaction of people all following similar paths, but because it's audio, those paths can, can diverge. Um, you know, there, there's no two guitars that sound the same. Uh, it, it's, it's this wonderful combination of art and science. And the people who, who are at the AS, who show up at conventions, who present papers, who volunteer their time to do this, are doing this out of passion. And, and that's what makes it a rich experience for me. Sorry, I went off there. That's, that's really wonderful. So I guess I can go next. Um, my relationship with AES started when I was a, a student at McGill um, in, a long time ago. And, um, and I first learned about the AES because McGill had a wonderful sound recording program. And that's when I started going to the library and digging into the AES journals and just started to learn a lot through, through reading the journals. I, at that time, I didn't feel worthy enough to become a member. So I didn't even consider, I thought, well, I'm not, I don't know enough to become a member. Um, but it wasn't until I went to grad school, I was doing my master's um, at NYU, where I'm a professor right now. And uh, I discovered the, the world of 3D audio. And again, I just went into, into the AES journals and was literally gobbling up all the information that I could get. And it was around that time that I also was reading um, the book written by Duran Bagal. It was at the time, the Bible on 3D sound. And, and somebody suggested, you know, you should go to this, there's an AES event. And, um, and so I decided to go and um, Duran Bagal was giving a talk. He was an AES member, he was giving a talk. And I, uh, I went up to him and I introduced myself and he shook my hand. And I was just, oh my God, 
my idol, my God, shook my hand and I swear I did not wash my hand until the end of the day, hoping that some of his DNA would rub off on me. And and I think it did because I'm still doing 3D sound and, and immersive sound. Um, and that's when I said, you know what, this is the most amazing uh, community where people are just so generous and so kind. Uh, Randy ended up becoming a very good friend of mine. And so I got heavily involved in the AES because they're going to And um, uh, and it wasn't uh, until I b began working at NYU in the in 2006 that I got very heavily involved and um, became became um, uh, uh, much more involved in the conventions and and chairing uh, chairing some of the conventions and being papers chair. And I discovered what an amazing community it is. I met so many of my friends through the AES, and I have uh, I continue to uh, evolve my network. And continue to to truly have the AES be at the at the core of how I learn, how I continue to learn about everything that's audio, how I continue to evolve as as somebody who is in a field that is so rapidly changing. And honestly, I just cannot imagine uh, uh, how I could stay relevant in this field. That every year there's something new, and uh, the AES is this this nucleus of people around the world who are the best of the best in this field. And we come together, whether it's you know, through, through, through the journal or through conferences or conventions, we come together and, um, and we become this, this family. And I think it's really, for me, it's really amazing to see how my connection to the, the AES has evolved from somebody who was a student uh, who you know didn't feel worthy? Although I can't believe I was thinking that because the MBA is it's such a wonderful place for students to being somebody who was in, in was in their early career where I was developing my network and connecting to people and uh, and learning about what is even possible to now being a little bit later on mid career and now uh, really reaching out to the AES and through the AES. Um, having this this source it's like a it's like a spring you know it's a source of all this knowledge that is that is bursting um so it's been a very exciting journey and uh, and it continues to be an exciting journey and i continue to meet new people through the aes and i continue to discover um all these facets of AES that I, I hadn't seen before. And now in my position as AES president, I'm, um, you know, I kind of see the, the, the bigger umbrella and realize that uh, in terms of the international connectedness that exists within the AES community, it is remarkable where there's people on, I think all continents except Antarctica, I believe, right? I think we have one continent to go. Uh, but it's truly this worldwide network of people, and it's been an, an amazing journey. You do wash your hands, though, now, I trust. <laughs> I do, yes, yes. Yeah, hopefully we will, we will get someday back to that time. But um, can I, I, I'd like to just add a, uh, an anecdote. It's kind of, a, it's a little bit abstract, but, but that expresses something that I find very compelling about my own experience and maybe other people will, it'll resonate for other people. Um, and it kind of ties into something that I said earlier, but um, I remember, and, and I think this, the title of this is the membership, the people who are in AES ultimately are the people who create AES and, and, and are the ones who help to sort of set the direction of AES. And um, I remember, it wasn't that long ago, maybe 10 years ago or so, maybe a little bit more, I found myself sort of feeling that the frustration that comes from, you know, looking at a, a convention program and thinking, you know, how come they're not doing this? Or how come they're not doing that? Or how come, or, you know, I've got this idea and how come my idea isn't the one that's showing up in the program? And, you know, I've had this happened in other experiences in my life where I look at something and I think I have a good idea, but I feel either unworthy or somehow frustrated uh, that, I, that I, whatever I think might be interesting isn't being represented. And so I had two choices at that point. One was to say, well, this organization is just not for me. And the other is to say, now, wait a minute. I wonder if there's maybe something more to this. 
So let me see if I can get involved with the organization and learn more about what's going on. And so I volunteered to help out with a convention and um, was given actually a fairly interesting area of uh, a convention track to curate. Um, there's kind of the miscellaneous workshops and the things that didn't fit neatly into other tracks. But, but the, by the experience of being involved with the organization and the team, what I discovered was there are some number of people who are busting their butts, working really, really hard, doing everything they can to put on the most interesting and exciting event possible. And they were completely welcoming of my energy and my ideas. It was simply a matter of showing up. And I have discovered, and I mean this, you know, without, I think, being disingenuous at all, I've discovered that if I bring my energy and I bring my interest, I have the ability to affect programming, to get some of the things that are interesting and exciting to happen. And some of the things that are really interesting and exciting to me that are happening at conventions, um, I, I think I'm not alone in, in my interests and, you know, some of the, the efforts that we're driving. And we can talk a little bit more about that later if and when the time comes. Um, but, but those things are happening. And so I think, you know, I think many of us feel like, well, I see this thing going on out there. It's not exactly what I'm into. You know, it seems like it might be cool, but it's not exactly what I'm into. So maybe I'll, you know, I'm not going to bother. Um, I think I'm encouraging people to push through that because there's such a rich opportunity uh, in AES and this sort of big tent and big umbrella to represent many, many different interests and a very sort of diverse community of interests um, that I just want to encourage people to, if you have an appetite and you have an interest, um, bring it. Um, because there's the organization, in my experience, has been incredibly welcoming. Um, so um, hopefully that'll it'd be encouraging to somebody who's watching or listening out there. Well, the organization is a society. You're describing a society. We're all members of the society. That's why it works. And you know, one thing that I find that's so amazing about the AES is, is that there are so many different ways to tap into the AES. Uh, whether it's if, if you're just wanting to read the, the the journal and access the information and be more of a, you know, somebody who sits in the library, that's cool. If you're somebody like Jonathan, a lot of energy, a lot of great ideas, and you want to be more of an active participant in the in the in the fabric of the society, that's cool. If you if you're wanting just to, to come to the conferences, come to the conventions and build your network, hang out with people, that's cool too. And or if you want to share your knowledge and educate others, that's you know that that's fabulous. Or if you want to be somebody who just comes to the conventions or comes to the conferences and absorbs all this knowledge knowledge that's cool so i think it's it's really it, there's something for everybody if you're into audio and you want to to learn about audio or meet people who are into audio or if you want to discover new products that's what the aes is for and so if you're if you're not a member aes.org slash join is where you need to go indeed sorry i stepped on someone there yeah, so one can be a a sort of passive member that that just gets the benefits of being a member. You get the journal, and in fact, if you're a member, you get everything the AES has ever published in over seventy five years. So that Bob Moog paper that Richard Factor spoke of is it's accessible to all of us who are members. So you can join to read the present journal and stay current, as Agnieszka must do. Um, but you can also read the history of all the developments. Um, but Jonathan points to a really important thing, which is you can volunteer. You can become an active member. The society is a reflection of the activities of those who do volunteer. And that's why it changes. That's why the content of the events changes. It evolves because someone as crazy as Jonathan and really everyone who's on this call steps up and says, we, we don't say, I think they should do this. Uh, why don't they? Wah, wah. It's easy to criticize and have an idea. But we all step up and try to make that happen, to make make the society reflect the discipline I care about, to include the people I want to include in the next panel and so on. Um, so you can start off just being a consumer of member benefits, but probably you're going to drink a little bit of the Kool-Aid and you eventually become a more active volunteer in the society. And you can do it at a local section level as well as helping to organize 
international events, which Jonathan was referring to. Alex, could I make a comment quickly about the volunteer community? So I've worked at a couple different associations and um, they all function very differently. And the thing with AES that was very apparent to me from, from my very first day was one, I don't, I don't have an, a background in audio. And so a few of you have mentioned the welcoming community. I don't even have a background in audio and people welcomed me. People were so excited to talk to me, to meet me. The community is really amazing, diverse. Um, spread out over the world, as Agnieszka mentioned. And it's, it was wonderful. I, I was not sure how, how I was going to be received as the first female executive director who did not have a background in audio. And the community has been, has been amazing. What I will also say is because I've had these other association experiences, the, the ones I've worked for before, everyone, you know, all members are passionate about what they do about the industry that they, that they represent. Um, and, and it's wonderful. That's why I work for associations. That's why I love what I do. But the thing with AES that is different than every other association that I've worked for is the volunteers. And I'm used, like I was used to as a staff person doing everything. Like, what do you need to do? I will do it for you. And then I will send it to you and we will wrap it up in a nice bow. And at AES, we have a small, very hardworking staff but the thing that has really blown me away is the dedication and activity of volunteers. And I have, especially Alex Agnieszka and Jonathan who I've worked with a bunch, it's basically like another full-time job for the three of you. And it's extraordinary. Like the dedication and, and, and commitment that you have to the organization that all of our volunteers have to the organization is truly unlike any other association or society out there. And it's truly an honor to work with people who are so passionate. It makes my job more enjoyable, more fun. And, you know, it not having a background in audio, it can sometimes feel, or like I worked for a medical association before. I care deeply for it, but it's hard. It's sometimes hard if you don't have a background. And if you're not a true member yourself, it can be hard to sometimes identify with the group. And that's not been an issue for me at all with AES because of how passionate and um, dedicated and excited people are about audio and about AES specifically. So I wanted, I don't know how many associations other people watching or participating are a member of. And I think it's important to know that AES really is unique and special because of the people driving the work forward. And we're very lucky. I just want to say, Colleen, thank you so much. You're validating uh, some version of normalcy for all of us because, you know, us in the audio world sometimes feel like we're a little bit over here <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're telling us it's really okay we're not that yes. we're, yeah great thank you very much i think a lot of us join for the gear or for the learning but i think we stay because of the people i think i think that's underestimated especially by students and i should point out you can be a student member of the aes uh, and the application is very simple. If you're in an audio program, you can be a studio, student member. That's the only qualification you need. Um, and and I think students often underestimate the value of the network that you build through AES. The world isn't scary and big. If you're in the AES, we can subdivide the world into a group of accessible people, like the people who, who are on this uh, live stream. So when you attend a local event, when you attend a regional event, when you attend an international event, you shake the hands of some of your heroes who write the books and do the research you value, but they do become friends. And you, you have this ever growing collection of friends and colleagues from whom you learn, with whom you get to collaborate. And, and I think that's the real value to an AES membership. And it's not obvious at first. At first you think I'm a member, so I get, a, it makes attending the events much more affordable and I can read the present journal and all past journals and I can look at videos that archive all past uh, or a lot of past events in the AES live video library. Those are all good reasons to join, but very quickly you find out you join to continue to hang out with the experts who are also your friends. And to share your passions. Indeed. So I work with um, a large number of students at, at NYU and, um, and you know, a lot of them, 
not all of them are, are AES members. And, uh, and I talk to them about that. And, uh, you know, they go to the conventions, especially the ones that are in New York because it's so local, or they go to conferences and they publish. And uh, I'm always amazed when I speak to them and they tell me how they have developed relationships with people through the AES who are specifically doing research in their field. And so they feel very comfortable reaching out to these experts um, beyond talking to, to the professors and, and on a day-to-day -day basis, but they have developed these relationships and these, these people, these experts at the AES have now contributed to their learning and even have become um, uh, advisors for their master's thesis or dissertations. It is very, very common and I'm always so impressed and so, um, so thrilled and humbled to see the level of involvement to uh, to connect with students and to 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 work with them, um, and they're extremely generous with their time, and it's it's such an, a wonderful experience for students because they become part of the the network, they become part of the fabric. So when it comes time for them to look at that next step post post graduation, they already have a network that they can that they can reach out to or or have internships. And these relationships are so very important in in many fields, but especially in, in this field. Graham, we've talked a lot about connections that are around research and learning. You also have connections among members of industry. I wonder if you can speak to what you're doing there and help people understand the AES role in connecting with designers, manufacturers, retailers, and so on. Sure. Well, as we are an industry body society, um, we're made up from a lot of people that love the industry, but also work inside it. And a lot of the companies um, that not only exhibit with us with our events and supporters are also instrumental in being part of the society as well. We've got a number of people who work in the industry that um, are also volunteers and help put together events, put together their own regions and sections where they have meetings and get togethers, they listen to seminars um, and um, everyone's very active and very passionate about it. Um, and that goes through all stages from people who are um, into um, putting together items such as audio networking through to your live console desks, uh, microphones, everything. So, um, I get involved with all those obviously a lot because um, I look after a lot of the events that we do, the major ones in particular. And um, everyone's still very passionate and almost like a family, really lovely tight knit together. Um, and it, it's the passion that I think keeps the industry going and will keep it going, especially through these times as well, because everyone wants to um, help each other and um, being part of a tight knit community and especially those that benefit from um, having connections such as we have in the AS. Um, we try and help each other out as much as possible as well. So, and we have a sustaining member program for companies as well in the AS that um, helps to bond those together and communicate a little bit more effectively and find out what's going on and get involved in the latest technology and how they put it across to not only the rest of the industry, but to the world as well. Yeah, uh, Alex, I'm so so glad that you brought that forward, um, there, that um, AES is a place where practitioners and meets manufacturing, meets research, um, which is such a rich uh, sort of cross-section of um, our audio world. I, I know, uh, again, from my own experience, having come into this as a practitioner, somebody who was focused on music production on the music side, I, I would often get to the point where I felt as if I had come to the, the limit of my understanding of how something would work. And AES is a place where I could either at a convention or simply by calling up a, a, a member who's a friend of mine and say, now, every time this thing happens, what's really going on? What's going on under the hood? Or, you know, what does that control do? Um, somebody who could shed some light on the, the sort of, you know, peel, peel back the hood, if you will, look underneath, find out what's going on on a deeper level. And that ultimately would help me advance my own craft in my work. Um, and that's, again, something that I wasn't necessarily expecting to happen, but um, it's such a, a rich um, confluence of interests. And I think it benefits everyone. I think manufacturers, I'm sure, feel the same way, that they learn things from practitioners. You know, if you're, if you're a mix engineer and you show up at AES, 
that Tony is probably really curious to know, well, what are you doing with my, you know, harmonizer? Is there some invention there in terms of your practice that I could then use to help inform my design? So it's really a bi-directional benefit. Or, or why doesn't it do what I, what I think it should? Or why, you know, why can't it do this? Now, look, all of that's true. You know, as, as a designer and manufacturer, it's an incredibly rich experience because you get to see what other people are doing in their products, but you also get to talk to the people who are designing those products. And then you get practitioners coming by, mixers, producers, but also the occasional artist who will say, wouldn't it be wonderful if it could do this? Or I've been using your box or your software and I get confused here or there. And that, that, that's precious information. I don't know how you would, how you would do that re research uh, so effectively. There's so many people strain by. And again, I, I'm gonna go back to the fact that we're all in this because we're passionate about this, this art. And pe because of that passion, people are very uh, free to, uh, feel free to, to let you know what they think. Uh, it could get brutal at times, but um, we've survived. Is, is there a specific example of that that you can share without getting anyone in trouble? Where, where the epiphany uh, came in part? You, you put me on the spot. I, I think there are too many examples of that because it, it, I can't think of anything specifically. Richard, can you help me out here? Have we ever been at an AES where, uh, where, where someone's come to us and, uh, and pointed something out that we did wrong? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, absolutely. Okay. Not <laughs> well, just in case we had. I mean, I'll, I'll sort of flip that around a little bit, but I, I mean, I've, I've certainly witnessed some of those same conversations within the context of, of the shop over at Isotope. And, and, and sometimes people have really interesting ideas and you can't do everything. I mean, every right. manufacturer sort of has, has a, uh, there's an integrity of their effort and the scope and so on. And so you do what you do. But um, I just want to, uh, I want to make sure to be able to say the following um, specifically to Eventide, um, to say, thank you. I think you are in some part responsible for my career in audio engineering in the following way. Um, I was a teenager and there was a record that came out by an artist named David Bowie called Low, who right. took your harmonizer and used it to do something that you did not design it to do, which was to mistreat the snare drum on a couple of tracks on that record and it blew my mind the marriage of technology and music and the sort of creativity around the use of technology in 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 creative and unintended ways is exactly what drew me into this the sort of spirit of invention um that that was imbued in in the making of that record or involved in the making of that record but anyway i just wanted to say to well, you well, thank you well that, that's very kind but <laughs> if we're gonna go back into ancient history so, you know, when I was a, a, a kid in school, uh, Ichiku Park came on with that wild flanging sound. And that's what got me, you know, that's one of the things that got me going, you know, seeing the Beatles on, on Ed Sullivan. So, um, and, and that triggers another thought. So that, that, that first device, that first harmonizer, the H910 that you're referring to glitched, okay? It did some crossfades and the crossfades weren't intelligent and it made a glitching sound. And people complained about that. And I spent two or three years of my life coming up with an algorithm to remove the glitches. And then people missed, they complained about the glitches, not having glitches. Why doesn't a new box glitch? So. Yeah, so, so then you had to make two models. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, we had to put in a glitching algorithm. And in fact, the first H910 didn't have a crystal based oscillator. So it drifted and people love the fact that it drifted. You know, they would, uh, if they had two in a studio and most studios who could afford an H910 probably had two because they didn't always work. So you needed a backup. But if you had two working ones, you can set one to slightly above one and slightly below one, you know, pitch ratios and have a beautiful stereo spread and since both of those boxes were unstable, they would move about, and that was very pleasant. Now, as an engineer, that drove me crazy. So the next, the next version was a crystal base, and everything was rock steady, and people complained about that as well. So, 
I don't I, yeah, I, I'm not one sure why I'm bringing valuable. this up, but what's that? One of the most valuable things about uh, being at conventions is listening to complaints. Yeah, people just complain all the time. Yeah, very, very few of them come around and, uh, you know, throw brickbats at you. Most of them uh, have a complaint, and the complaint is a uh, germ for a new product or... Uh, Get your thinking. It's, uh, it's very valuable. Yeah, it's incredibly valuable. Because they're complaining because they care. They're trying to use these things artistically. They're, you know, so... Uh, again, I mean, I said it earlier, with that, without the AES, uh, I would not have had this career. Um, it, without the AES, Eventide would not have been as successful. As successful. Uh, some of our, um, our lead DSP developer, our lead researcher, well, I met him at AES. Uh, a number of other of our, our developers came to us because they stopped by the booth at AES. So if I could sort of hi hijack that and, ex and bring it into the sort of AES ethos as well, or the conversation to say that um, we really love input from members about things that they want to do and things that they want to drive and things that they would like to see that are different. It, it doesn't always make for the easiest conversations, but boy, it's, um, it makes for interesting conversations. And in the long run, I think that uh, change is manifest. Um, so that's that I, I love what you're describing there and Richard when you said you know those become germs for the next version of things same for AES as an organization what are some ways that uh people new to the AES could contribute to the AES what are the ways to volunteer when you get to sort of phase two you're beyond the journal and you're beyond just attending events and learning what are and so I guess I'm asking specifically what are some ways some of you have made your first step towards enhancing your relationship with the AES. Well, could I, could I, I want to quickly say too, with the world so different right now, I think that there are actually many more ways to be involved with AES. Um, we're doing a lot of innovative online learning coming up and we're not experts in that. We're trying our best. And I think you're going to, it's going to be very cool. And the experiences that we provide are going to be very exciting. But we want this to be, this is like the foundation of where we think this can go, this online learning concept. It's very common, of course, like there's a lot of free content everywhere. And so it's not necessarily competing with any of the content that's there, but there we will need people to help us, you know, vet content, come up with content that they want to do, uh, that they, if they want to do a webinar, some type of series, if they want to edit videos. So there's this whole side of online learning that is brand new to AES that I think that it opens up this, this new world. Additionally, I think we do a great job trying to engage people on social media. And I know that John Crivet is watching and he has a community on Facebook that is very active. And I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity from a social media side too, and uh, engaging people in our, in, on the Facebook pages and LinkedIn and Twitter and so forth. So all of these, I don't want to say new opportunities, but I think that we have our, our probably standard volunteer opportunities that I'm hoping Agnieszka, Tony, Richard, and Jonathan can talk about. But I think that really there's, there's the new online stuff, there's the social media stuff, and then probably a hundred other things that I'm not even thinking of. And for me, I don't, I don't think, certainly from a staff perspective, and I, I don't want to talk for the board either, but we're not approaching it like we know exactly what we need to do. We know everything and we're gonna, we're gonna tell everyone exactly what we need done all the time because we don't. Like this is really bringing to the forefront that there are so many other things out there that we can do, that we can explore. And of course, resources are, are a potential issue, like if it's something that costs a boatload of money, but if we have dedicated volunteers or someone stepping forward and saying, it would be really cool if AES did this for students or it'd be really cool if AES did this for sections and we can get a group of volunteers to work on that I think that there are so many more volunteer opportunities that exist with AES than we are even aware of. So I just wanted to set that as probably as, as part of the discussion um, and then hope that Agnieszka and Jonathan and others can talk about perhaps more of like the standard or traditional volunteer opportunities. So yeah, I absolutely agree. And I just want to follow up with um, uh, to Colleen's point to say that I mean, the AES is an evolving society. 
And we have, the, the AES has been around for over 75 years. And during that time, uh, you know, the AES started in a, in, a, in a time that there was just sound recording, live sound. It was just that. Now the AES has really blossomed and branched out into so many different uh, to the, so many different topics and, and areas and industries within the audio world. And it's truly amazing to, to see this. Uh, so to, to the volunteer point, we, um, we recognize this. And to, in order for the AES to evolve, we rely on our members. We rely on the volunteers. And we are very excited to have people come to us and say, you know what, I wish we could do this. And, you know, I'm, I'm saying, let's do it. You know, if we can, absolutely, let's do it. Bring us your ideas. If you're willing to roll up your sleeves, there is really no boundary to what you what you can do through the AES. Um, I think that to something that may be more, more practical, um, something that I have seen a lot of uh, people do uh, who, who wanted to volunteer is to start with their local section. Sometimes that's a much more comfortable way to start. Find out where, who, and where your local section is. Whether it's you know maybe a student section through your through your academic institution or in the city that you live in or or close by, um, and join that that local section. Meet the people and just go up to the leaders of that section and say you want to become a volunteer and tell them what specifically you would like to do. Sometimes that's a really good place to start. Right now, we're living in a time that's very unusual, where there are no geographical boundaries, right? Right now, we can't get together physically in most places anyway. Um, so right now, those geographical boundaries and those physical boundaries have gone away. Gone away. So um, reach out to the, to the sections that you feel more comfortable with, or perhaps you know a person, and, and start there. If you're willing to get involved with 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 conventions or volunteer conventions, you can always reach out to to us. And and I I'm very happy to to hear from you specifically. If you'd like to reach out to me directly, send me an email. Uh, it's a roginska at aes.org, and I'm I'm very happy to to personally guide you um, if you would like. Yeah, I, I think I want to pick up th that comment that you made, Agnieszka, about um, how the boundaries have come down. You know, um, geographic boundaries, some, some people don't have access to local sections. Um, my, my hope is that there are people who are watching and listening to this right now who are saying, you know, I, you know, in my town, there is no AES section, so what can I do? Well, there may be an opportunity and a silver lining in what's happening right now in the sense that we are beginning to think about how to create meeting places and places of where people can interact that are not necessarily physically connected and facilitate that connection online. Um, even before the pandemic, we were starting to see some sections, I'll, I'll call out Bobcats and the Central Florida section, where they were hosting events and making them available to members uh, in as live events. There was also something recently hosted by um, uh, the Seattle Pacific Northwest uh, Seattle chapter um, made available online so that people who were not necessarily able to go to a local event now can go to an AES event. Um, we have a Facebook group, the official AES discussion area, which is another virtual meeting place where people who are members can come and find other people and find out about these virtual events. Um, so my, my hope is that um, that we will be able to sort of to, to build an international community uh, better going forward and be accessible to people who are in more different places. Um, going back to what you said, however, if you know two or three people who are in your town who are nuts and passionate about audio as you are, um, you know, it, it's not unheard of for people to start AES chapters in their towns and grow them and um and you know there's what is it the uh, the tom sawyer effect you know you start painting that fence and you'll find other people who want to paint that same fence along with you if you haven't read that story go read it so i thought it was a song with really good drums <laughs> oh you reminded us of neil <clears throat> The next AES edition of this Wednesday afternoon event is oriented towards high school education. Uh, and I wonder if anyone here would care to speak to education in general for educators. How is AES meaningful to educators? Because certainly a lot of our members 
in fact, many people here are educators and we find AES a great complement to what we can deliver to our students and what we can learn from each other. So I wonder if anyone could speak to that. Well, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, I mean, you know, I'll st actually, I will start by saying that one of the best ways to learn how to do something is to teach it. <laughs> so um, many of the people uh, who I admire, uh, and I'll take Kev Kevin Killen, for example, he's somebody who, who not only is an amazing, amazing music producer, but the way he can articulate what he does and talk about it and, and impart that to other people. And I think he does this not just with students, but he does it with artists as well. I think it makes him the complete package. Um, anyway, um, I think that, um, that, you know, AES, I mean, audio education has exploded over the last 20 years. We have many, many more programs, audio uh, as an interest, as a vocation, is something that's really exploded. Um, as it, it's uh, audio is more part of um, you know marketing online. It's uh, tech companies have big audio departments that are doing all kinds of things in their own sort of manufacturing and uh, and product development. Um, and so I think that um, that that is a place of such growth and such rich. Uh, interests and there's so much to be shared there. Um, we have a strong community of audio educators. We have a, a, a conference. Uh, unfortunately, the physical version of it, this that was planned for this year, will not be happening. That will be deferred. But we're still hoping to have some small online version of that and then satisfy the appetite for that down the road where audio educators can come together, learn from each other, learn about what each other is doing. Um, we have strong, strong student sections. Um, and there's some overlap between them, obviously. Um, but I, I really think that it, I, I'm just going to sort of abstract this to a, a larger point, which is, I think all of us in AES are here to learn. I think we're all learners and education is just a, an activity that infuses everything that happens, uh, in AES. So, so I just want to add one point to, to said, which is um, for educators, it's, um, it's yes, it's about uh, connecting to the educators around you. It's uh, learning about what, what other people are teaching and how they're teaching it. But I also want to underline the enormous amount of resources that the AES has specifically for educators and specifically for education at all levels, right? We're talking about uh, the, the, the journal, the articles, conference uh, proceedings, um, over, you know, I think, 17,000 publications. You're talking about hundreds and hundreds of videos that are available to AES members where you, where you hear from the experts, where you, where you hear from those people who are, you know, the people that, that, that you admire, that your students admire. I think this gives educators an enormous amount of resources to pass on to students and to, to really help you teach and help you create your curriculum and help you design design a curriculum that is both very interesting um, to, to students, but also very rich in information and uh, by people who are truly the experts in their field. And that is a, I mean, I, when I teach, I use this resource um, um, a lot in, in my classes and, and with my, in my courses for students to, for them to tap into the, the AES resources, for them to tap into those videos, uh, because this is something that you just can't get anywhere else. Thank it's you. available online. Sorry, Jonathan, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to tell you that you were muted. Actually, I'm not muted. I'm just moving. It's a Zoom joke. Um, now I forgot what I was going to say entirely. Yeah, what are you? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I also want to mention that we have uh, student recording competitions. Uh, that are judged a couple of times a year around our conventions. And, um, you know, students get really excited about it um, because they kind of get to put their stuff up and then listen to the stuff that comes from other schools and, and, uh, and share and kind of learn from each other and kind of be wowed and maybe humbled by each other. But I also think educators get really excited about those competitions as well. Um, to sort of, they're proud of their students and they're proud to sort of show what's going on uh, in their programs. And um, I don't know, I think it's an exciting event. It's like our own mini uh, Olympics for uh, student recordings. 
And and despite the quarantine, that event goes on, as does uh, a, a virtual version of our convention, which we call Virtual Vienna. I wonder if someone could sketch out what we might expect uh, in about three weeks as AES moves the Vienna convention to a virtual experience. I'm going to suggest Colleen take this. <laughs> I was moving to unmute myself, thank you. Um, yeah, so we have a, a very exciting, uh, we have been able to um, work with a lot of our presenters, our workshops and tutorials presenters and our authors who had planned to, to convene in Vienna. Um, we have been able to work with them to shift, to pivot to an online only event. And it was not a small undertaking because as I mentioned earlier, you know, the online world, the online learning world is not, we have AES Live, which is our repository of videos, but we don't do a lot of online, purely online learning. And so this was, it was quite an undertaking. We had a number of board members working on it. Of course, the Vienna Convention Committee and our presenters and authors have been very happy and willing to take this ride with us. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep it the same number of days, which is four days. It's one week later um, than it was supposed to be. So it's going to be held June 2nd through 5th. And um, there's a lot of information on AES at aeseurope.com. Um, we're still in the process of building up a schedule because of time zones and uh, conflicts and, and things that people have going on. Um, but it's going to be a bunch of sessions, a bunch of content. I'm trying to think about the number off the top of my head. It's well over 100 um, sessions that we'll have available from a combination of workshops plus uh, paper presentations and poster presentations. A lot of things are going to be uh, video on demand, but we also have a live broadcast that is going to um, include live Q&A. So it's very exciting. Um, the platform that we are working with for Vienna, um, we will also be using for New York, uh, regardless of what that event looks like, whether it's purely in person, um, hybrid or pure, purely virtual. You know, obviously that's something that's ongoing, but we're getting uh, a really good understanding of how the platform works now. And um, we anticipate a very smooth and easy process, both for our presenters and for our attendees. And we're very excited about it. We've had, we have way more registrants at this point than we um, expected. So we're really looking forward to bringing a community together, even though it won't be in person, being able to have that sense of community in a couple of weeks. And, and geography just isn't a barrier anymore. So as we go virtual, we no longer have to get ourselves to the location of the event. So hopefully people from truly everywhere but Antarctica will be able to, to register for this event and, and tune in. A lot of people might think, gosh, AES conventions were expensive for me to attend. You should note most of the money doesn't go to AES, right? It goes to the hotel and to the airline. So this virtual event has a different cost structure. And so the pricing has come down accordingly as well, hasn't it? That's right. Yeah. For um, AES members, it's only $50. And for students, it's $25. So that's really a fraction of what you would pay for an in-person event. Um, and we actually have heard from a, a lot of a lot of members, one and presenters truly that they're very happy that we were able to make this happen, that this is something that they're excited about because the assumption was definitely that we just wouldn't have anything. And so the, the fact that our convention committee and our board and our presenters and authors are willing to do this and happy to do it and excited to do it is really extraordinary. Um, but also we've heard from a lot of members that said, I've never been able to attend a convention because of the cost or because you know it's, it's way too far for me to travel and I have a family at home or, or whatever the reason is. And now it's accessible for everyone and people are thrilled about that. Uh, we've been we've been receiving a lot of very positive feedback from our community, and I do think you know it's going to be different without question. This is not going to be what people typically expect from an in-person event, but we are going to have our Heiser lecture. We have three wonderful keynotes. Um, we have an excellently curated uh, program, um, thanks to the people who wanted to participate, but also our convention committee. And is it true we're going to be publishing Wiener Schnitzel uh, recipes? Is that is that correct? Well, that was a secret, but yes, it's out now. <laughs> yes, just a little taste of Vienna. That's right. Well, that, that all sounds fantastic, and and you'll adapt, and you'll you'll get better at 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 doing that. And 
just just like the geographical constraints go away, uh, the calendar constraints might also go away. You might be able to to have more, you know, still scheduled events, but not have to plan everything for this massive in-place event once or twice a year. Um, yeah, I, I will say I'm, I'm also part of the, uh, the New York Convention Planning Committee, our fall convention planning. Had the pleasure of working with Agnieszka and, uh, on, on last year's event in New York. And um, as we start to think about what might be possible, it's really, really exciting. I mean, there's, there's some things that we're going to miss by not being able to shake hands this year uh, in Vienna. Um, but, um, but when we think about some of the things that we might be able to do, I'll, I guess what I'll say is we might be able to take people places they've never been before. And I'll just leave it at that. Wow. We have got some other events we've been looking at in the pipeline that um, are slightly different from our normal conventions and conferences as well. We uh, ran the first um, AS Worship Academy Worship Sound Academy in Nashville this year. Um, we have the um, AS Professional Sound Academy that we do in conjunction with NAM at their event in January. And um, we uh, may have other things coming soon. Wow, you're just going to leave us hanging. Well, I do want to do a, a quick... On, uh... I'm sorry, Agnieszka, go ahead. Sorry, my internet glitched right at the moment I was supposed to say the most important thing, which is our a, a conference on audio for virtual and augmented reality in, in August that's coming up. And uh, that's going to be exciting. If I could also say one thing about the Vienna, the virtual Vienna convention too, uh, we have, we at all of our conventions, we have an education and career fair. And that is something that we're always very excited about and love the support from the companies and the institutions, the schools. And they are, uh, our education co-chairs, Magdalena and John have been reaching out to companies and schools for the virtual Vienna convention specifically now that it's virtual thinking like maybe we'll have just a couple interested in participating. And we've had the last I heard it was over 30 that we've had that responded saying that they want to participate. And it's really excellent. Now people are gonna be able to be exposed to, to companies and schools that perhaps they wouldn't otherwise have been. And this is, when you think of the, the whole concept of AES, building community, we've focused a lot of our discussion today on the community and how special and unique it is. And while we're not gonna to be together in person and shaking hands, as Jonathan just mentioned, there's still this, this idea, uh, this desire and this drive to bring people together, to, to expose people to new ideas, or companies or schools or people or new ways of doing things. Um, and we're still able to do that. And I think AES is uniquely positioned to drive that forward for our members and our stakeholders. And I'm, I'm just glad that we have the opportunity to do that in a couple of weeks um, to get that started. So members already know this. If you're not a member, visit AES.org uh, to learn more. Maybe visit AES.org slash join. Uh, and scroll down that page. If we try to sketch out the value for membership, uh, there's a lot there. I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, I, I want to respect people's time, so I think we ought to uh, wrap things up pretty quickly, but I'll just summarize or, or point out the following, which is when Jonathan was a teenager, he heard cool stuff in a record based on a device and whose inventor is present here and you guys met because of AES. It's not that mysterious. We can all be the future Jonathans who meet future Tonys by becoming, it's simple, by becoming involved in AES, you, you will find it's easy to meet people, meet really bright people, make yourself smarter, uh, and have a lot of fun along the way. So I really like seeing Tony and Jonathan on the same call today. And, and I'd like to say that anyone who, any, any youngster who has a passion for this, is, is in any way doing recording, studying recording, downloading pl plugins, join the AES. It'll be well worth your while. You'll learn so much. Um, um, this has just been a glimpse. You know, someone mentioned the, the papers that go back 75 years. You can, you can learn a lot by studying some of the history. You know, the path of this technology will, will help lead you into, into its future. Well, of course, 
Tomorrow at four, there's another Quarantide. Next Wednesday at four is another AES edition of the Quarantide. So we'll hope to see you all there and then. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. All of you. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Eventide. Thank you. Thank you, AES. Yes, thank you.